Hello, and welcome to the CAP Today webinar for Wednesday, August 15th. I'm glad that you've joined us. Today's webinar is entitled, The Aftermath of an Overwhelming Flu Season, A Discussion of Lessons Learned. I'm Bob McGonigal, the publisher of CAP Today, and as usual, I'll serve as your moderator, and after our formal presentations have concluded, I will lead a question and answer session. Our sponsor today, to whom we're very grateful, is Luminex for their support for this commercial webinar of CAP Today. Our speakers, and I'll say more about them in a moment and give you some greater detail, are Dr. Margie Morgan of Cedars sinai and Dr. Gregory Berry of Northwell Health in New York. But first, let me run through some important housekeeping notes and tips. First, I suggest that you refresh your browser. This may optimize the syncing of slides and sound. You'll, most of you will be listening through your computer speakers if you have any technical difficulties, however, we do have an 888-364-8804 number that you see in the lower right-hand corner of your computer screen. We have live attendants standing by to help you with any technical problem that arises, so feel free to use that if that's needed. Also, of course, we have a question and answer box that's located beneath the slides, and throughout today, you can type in questions and comments for our speakers and our topics, and we will get, address those in the question and answer session at the end of the session today. In about five to seven days, we will be archiving this webinar online, both the slides and the audio, at captodayonline.com, so you can look for that. You should also know you can expect to receive an email or two uh, from us, either to follow up with the survey and, of course, from our sponsor, Luminex, who will be anxious to follow up with anyone after this event. Let me uh, finally, though, note that uh, CAP Today does not endorse any product or service that may be named within the webinar today. And any comments that I make are those that are purely personal, not to be taken as policy of CAP today or the College of American Pathologists. Once again, I want to thank Luminex for their special educational grant that has made today possible. And now uh, let me introduce my speakers, as I promised in greater detail, addressing our topic, the aftermath of a memorable flu season. We're going to hear two presentations that are brief introductions, and then that will be followed by a tandem presentation from both speakers uh, back and forth throughout the rest of the presentation. Our second speaker in the intro will be Dr. Gregory J. Berry. He's a doctoral scientist and a diplomat of the American Board of Medical Microbiology. He's Assistant Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell in New York. And at Northwell Health Laboratories, he's the Director of Molecular Diagnostics and the Assistant Director of Infectious Disease Diagnostics. And our speaker who will lead off today in a moment is Dr. Margie Morgan, who we've had the pleasure of working with on these webinars many times. Dr. Morgan is also a PhD scientist. She's also a medical technologist and is a diplomat of the American Board of Medical Microbiology. She's the Director of Microbiology at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, and she's there a professor of pathology and laboratory medicine. And with that, I'm going to invite Dr. Morgan to begin her presentation. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. Um, and I'm going to be 
sharing with you some of our pain that we experienced over last year, and I'm sure that you will share in my story and have many questions and things following. I'm sure all of us suffered through somewhat the same experience. Hopefully our presentation today will bring some of it back around and we can talk about how we can do some of these things better. But first off, where am I from? Well, I'm from Cedar sinai Medical Center, which is in Los Angeles. Um, it's a tertiary care, multi-specialty, academic health science center. It's large, it's 920 beds. We have a lot of physicians, 2,300 physicians, and we're kind of unique. For being an academic center, we have mostly private practice physicians, which seem to go their own way. And so that can, um, we will talk later about educational efforts. And in my unique situation with all private practice doctors, sometimes that can be very challenging. We're a level one trauma center. We have a large number of immune suppressed, cancer, solid organ, and stem cell transplants. And over time, we've had a changing demographic at Cedars. We used to be very much of a general medicine type institution, but now we're having increasing admits for orthopedic surgery, general surgery, and we're um, a very large cardiac surgery, cardiac transplant center. We're also a little bit unique in that we're really an adult hospital. Most of our population is adults, and we have a very high percentage population of elderly. So our pediatric population is quite small. So I tend to think perhaps like an adult institution. So do remember that when I give some of my comments, you may see that um, coming through loud and clear. We have outreach. About 35% of our work in a microbiology laboratory is outreach work. We do work for Marina Del Rey Hospital, which is a 125-bed facility, and we have MD offices in the surrounding area. Also of importance is our laboratory is on site. We, uh, we are on the campus of Cedar sinai so that can help with transport and some of the things that we do in the microbiology laboratory. So how about last flu season? Well, I think we'll all, we all have our stories, I'm sure, but let, you, let me tell you ours in the Los Angeles area. Well, first off, Flu started kind of slow in November. We thought, oh, ho, oh, it's going to be our kind of usual, somewhat busy flu year. And so the positive started rolling in in November. But all of a sudden, on December 21st, the test numbers just seemed to accelerate. That day, ED was overflowing. They were on the phone. They were panicked. The hospital was reaching peak capacity. We had planned for what we thought was going to be somewhat of a busy flu season. We had ordered an unusually large number of flu A and B antigen tests that we used in our ED. We had a large number of targeted varigine respiratory pathogen flex tests, the RP flex, and we had ordered a moderate amount of syndromic molecular panels that we also used. We had planned for a busy year but we underestimated really how truly busy it was going to become. Also at the same time all this activity was going on, there was a Tamiflu shortage in some areas of Los Angeles, particularly areas that served our hospital. It ended up not a true Tamiflu shortage at the source of the drug, but just a distribution issue in Los Angeles. But that can kind of created to some of the panic that was going on as well. We contacted our stewardship group to ask for help. Perhaps they could mitigate some of the testing onslaught that was being provided, and maybe they could help us uh, with some of test guidance. But they were concerned about missing possible flu patients who were exhibiting unusual symptoms, particularly cardiac symptoms and such, or symptoms that could have been masked by comorbidities, and they did not enact any policy to help us lower the testing. So it was what it was. This was our flu algorithm in 2017 and 18. It started off in the emergency department with most patients getting point of care testing using a lateral flow membrane antigen test for flu A and B. You're going to think this is insane, but we were performing all these tests within our microbiology laboratory. We're a 24 seven laboratory on campus. This is because our ED laboratory did not believe they, they could, over time, for several years now, handle the increased load. It's a small laboratory with very few people. So we uh, took on the burden of doing the point-of-care testing. 
On the left-hand side, you can see if the patient was not seriously ill, they would have been discharged from the ED no matter whether their lateral flow test was positive or negative. There were some nights we were testing as many as 80 to 100 lateral flow at the height of influenza season. We also noticed in data collection post-season that the sensitivity of those lateral flow membrane tests markedly varied by week. Sometimes we had 30% sensitivity, sometimes 60%, sometimes a bit more, particularly in children. But we knew that we probably had an issue with variable and poor specimen collection. Now let's go to the right side of the chart. This would be our seriously ill patients and patients admitted to the hospital. We had a reflex testing algorithm. If they were positive with the lateral flow antigen test when tested NED, once they were admitted, there was no further testing performed. They were put in isolation and treated appropriately. However, if the test was negative lateral flow in the ED, that specimen was reflexed and we performed a flu A, B, and RSV targeted flex panel. If positive, the patient was isolated and put in precautions and treated. If negative, the MD had the ability to order um, the RP flex panel to be flexed open if they thought that that would provide help in the diagnosis of the patient. Well, what went wrong with all this planning that we had made? Well, first off, the, the specimens started coming in such volume that we rapidly depleted our supply of targeted RP flex due to the high numbers of patients that were admitted to our hospital that had negative flu AB lateral flow membrane tests. We were noticing at the time that a majority of our admitted patients were elderly over 65 years of age for rule out influenza. Also, we had noticed that around 50% of those being admitted in the elderly group had been previously vaccinated this season for influenza. Due to the agreed upon algorithm that we had for flu testing, we were really at the mercy of the ED to determine the patient's specimens to reflex test. If they had an antigen test performed in the ED, it was our infection control and stewardship group's edict that the algorithm would be us to use those same specimens from the ED to perform our reflex testing once they were admitted to the hospital. What else went wrong? Well, some physicians, although educated, were not aware of the ED to inpatient reflex algorithm that we had put in place. And of course, they were ordering duplicate molecular flu testing on their patients that were admitted, not recognizing the fact that those tests were already in line to be performed. This added an extra burden on the people in the microbiology laboratory because doing due diligence, we were trying to screen and make sure that we were not doing duplicate testing. However, of course, we came overwhelmed at times and we, we had some duplicate testing slip through. The increase in testing demand coincided, of course, what, what else, with the Christmas and New Year holidays. So not only did we have a very short skeleton staff in the laboratory, but also the hospitals, all the companies, everyone did. So supply orders were both slow to be processed within our institution and with vendors. So it really was the perfect storm. But of course, things can always get worse, and they did. Um, Luminex periodically could not supply our RP flex panels. Due to a nationwide demand, we were all just testing so many patients. And or at times also they could not ship. Remember the Nor'easters? Remember that FedEx shut down? So what could go wrong went wrong. And to top it all off, our central stores, which is central supply at Cedars, ran low on universal transport medium. We were really concerned at one point that we wouldn't have collection swabs. So they immediately had to order an overnight shipment and work with alternate vendors to get an adequate amount of universal transport media. And we were extremely lucky, and then we never actually ran out of collection swabs. 
we recognized while all this was going on, something's got to give here. We were overtaxing the RP Flex panels and instruments, and we needed to have additional testing capabilities. So we accelerated the contract that we were currently negotiating to acquire and validate the BioFire torch instruments. We were getting two new torch instruments, and at the same time, we kept our existing older BioFire units. So we had four active BioFire units capable of doing testing. This helped create redundancy and increased our testing capacity. It really did teach us that there's a real importance about having redundancy for this outbreak type pathogen testing, and we shouldn't really rely just on one instrument or one test panel. We always used the RP Flex panels preferentially when we had um, them available to be used. And then we could flex open to release more viral targets if those were ordered by the clinician. But if the RP Flex was not available due to the distribution and FedEx issues, or if our volume was just so soaring, we did lean on the BioFire syndromic panels to test first our intensive care unit patients, followed by the small amount of pediatric patients, and then others only if necessary. Uh, and this worked over time, but we had to, um, uh, we had to do something, although that we knew this was probably affecting our laboratory budget in many, many negative ways. Uh, we needed to have this redundancy and capability of testing. Approximately 70% of our results were available within about 24 to 36 hours. The primary delays were due to it was just too many, too many tests to do. Also, we were trying to test specimens up to 16 hours a day, but due to staff becoming ill and Christmas vacation scheduling, not all days were we able to run a full 16 hours. We only performed testing on the BioFire instruments while we were awaiting shipments of the RP Flex panels, as I said before. What was our flu activity data like then? Well, it had been the highest levels of influenza activity in testing ordered since 2009. In December, we saw mostly flu A, H3. We saw only 3% H1 and 15% flu B. But as we moved into January, we saw our influenza A percentage decrease and our influenza B uh, increase, in fact, almost double. The predominance of flu B peaked in February and continued until the end of the season and appeared to be in all different age groups. We detected also an increasing amount of RSV from December to January in our adult patient population. RSV actually comprised 20% of our viral burden in January. So we understood then the importance of us offering a primary molecular panel that offered influenza A, B, as well as RSV for our inpatient population during influenza season. At this point in time, I will hand it back to Bob. We, we're going to have another speaker discuss another take on the same problem that I just discussed. Dr. Morgan, thank you so much for that introduction and that history of a very uh, hectic and I'm sure at times uh, anxiety-provoking flu season at Cedars-Sinai. And now as promised for another take on that same problem, let me introduce once again Dr. Gregory Berry of Northwell Health. Well, thank you very much, Bob. And, you know, while Dr. Morgan was on the West Coast dealing with a wild flu season, we had a very similar situation beginning to develop here on the East Coast. And I'll get into the timelines and the details in a little bit. But first, let me tell you a little bit about our health system, so which is called Northwell Health. And so we are a large health system that's located in the uh, in the Long Island and New York City area. And we're also, we primarily serve this area and also we're branching out to Northern Westchester and other geographic regions as well. And just to give you an idea of the health system, I'll start over here on the left-hand side with caregivers. We have approximately 15,000 affiliated physicians. We have more than 15,000 nurses with almost 5,000 volunteers. Our economic impact every year is we have about an $11 billion annual operating budget with 66,000 employees 
which makes us the largest private employer in New York State. And we service an area that's about nearly 11 million people, so it's a very, uh, it's a very dense area as far as population. And the community impact uh, that, that is calculated is that we, we contribute more than a billion dollars annually in community benefit. And just I'll jump down here to operating statistics. Uh, we treat 2 million plus patients a year annually with over 4.3 million patient encounters. And you see the various other statistics there just to give you an idea of the health system. And the next picture I'll show you just to give you an idea. So here's the map. You can see that the, the hospitals in red here are the, the hospitals that are owned by the health system. We also have affiliate hospitals, which are in this dark this dark blue or purplish color, and we have strategic alliance hospitals, and we provide testing for many of these sites. And so with that, I'll move on to the respiratory testing options that we have in the health system. So there are several different methodologies of respiratory testing that are performed across the health system and in the different locations. And this testing would be performed, of course, in our core laboratory, which I'll talk a lot about today, but also in our hospital-based laboratories and in many of our outpatient clinics. And so if we're thinking about the outpatient clinics, for example, we're gonna be thinking about things more like rapid antigen flu testing, uh, whereas if we're talking about core laboratory testing and many of the hospital labs, we have full respiratory panels that are available at these in these um, these places. And we also have a limited panel of flu A, B, RSV, a limited molecular panel for flu A, B, RSV, at the core lab and uh, and which will also be rolled out this upcoming year in many of our hospital labs and in all of our hospital labs as we phase out rapid antigen testing for the uh, for the hospital based labs which it would still be in place though in the outpatient clinics and so when we talk about uh, the flu season and what we saw in the 2017-2018 flu season, really it parallels the intensity of what Dr. Morgan saw in California. Again, I just said we just had a shift in the time frame. So for us, in the first week of January, flu cases uh, were beginning to increase, and really uh, at that point is when we started to see testing ramp up and go above normal levels. We're really by the end of January and the very beginning of February, testing had already increased to an unprecedented number of, of tests per day. And I'll show you some of that data. And oddly enough, uh, flu B, as, uh, as Dr. Morgan saw the high rate of flu B, which was about 30% at one point, I recall, uh, we actually saw that flu B comprised 42% of our flu cases and actually began to increase concurrently with flu A right at the beginning of this flu spike, which was a really unusual trend for us. And so when we look at the breakdown of positivity for our respiratory panel results, you see here, uh, so the predominant strain for the year was, was in blue right here, and that was, uh, that was the H3N2 strain at 8%. But you see flu B actually matched the same number of cases at 8% here in the green. We also had a H1-2009 as a, as a smaller subset of flu. So really, uh, I think just to reiterate uh, how much flu B we saw out of our total volume of test numbers. And when we look at the volumes uh, and go back to that topic, so here's the preceding three years of our volume, 2015, 2016, 2017. Here you can see our volumes have increased over time as, we, as we've become larger as a health system. Uh, I'll focus here on this 200 mark. You can see in 2015, we don't even get there. We get it to about 150 at the beginning, at, at the end of the last season and into the beginning, and we don't reach that in 2015. By 2016, we, we are hitting the 200 mark consistently. 2017, we're almost right there, and then we're hitting it at the next end of the season. But watch this now. As we enter into this season, our testing for respiratory panels just spiked extremely high up to above the 600 mark. So this was uh, this was really a uh, this was really an incredible spike considering the preceding three years. And really, the last time that we had seen this uh, flu volume was was back in 2009 as well, from what I've uh, from what I've been told uh, historically. And so we weren't really alone in this. This trend was seen across New York State as far as cases. So let me present this data. So this is data from the New York State Department of Health, and this is confirmed number of reports that are actually positive laboratory results that are get reported by the laboratories in, to, in New York to the, to the New York State Department of Health. And see, you see here we have the 2014-2015 season in blue. 
we have the 2015-2016 season in, in brown here, and we have the 16-17 season in green. And then this red line is is just last season, the one we're talking about. And so here you see January 20, it's 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 above the levels of the last three years, but it's not incredibly high. But you see the trend on there looks like it's it's going to increase. Well, indeed, that's exactly what happened. By February 3rd, it had uh, it had already gone much higher than the than the other seasons had and had increased to more than double of what was seen in the previous three flu seasons. And then this continued to increase slightly as we move through February and you see it's starting to to flatten out but it's still going up at that point hitting a total of number of reports again more than uh, considerably more than double almost triple you can see 6000 was what we were hitting in past years and we're up at the 18000 already. And so we see this continue slight and so all of a sudden at the end of February there's all of a sudden this steep drop, and this steep drop really you see this rapid decline. Then as we as we enter into March, uh, and then as we go into April, you see it uh, decline back into well well below the the spike levels and back to no normal baseline. And really, uh, I think that uh, it just shows uh, really nicely in the data the kind of flu season that this was that that everybody talks about. And so. What specifically contributed to this testing boom? Really, what went wrong? And really, what went wrong, and I think that Dr. Morgan did a wonderful job covering the national bottlenecks that occurred, that occurred in test supplies. And in fact, we saw the same thing in New York. And this is just an excerpt from the New York Post. And if you could see it here, I know it's small, but it's from January 26th of, uh, of 2018, talking about flu testing. And uh, flu testing doesn't get into the newspaper too often, but when it does, uh, it's usually in situations like this, and here you can see this is just a, a quote from one of the people quoted in the article uh, talking about uh, distribution of medical supplies and, and what he, call, he calls it a crisis, that they totally exhausted their stock and that they had people begging for product and they needed to turn them away. So it tells you the intensity of what a, a bottleneck in supply chain can be. So there were enough tests. Uh, it's just that they weren't making it to where they needed to be in a timely fashion and they were getting used up. And so what happened as a result of this so things getting worse so that bottleneck hit us and hit everybody else and so as testing uh, increase the testing increase really coincided with multiple sites running out of tests uh, due to due to these these lack of uh, of supplies and the bottlenecks in supplies so a huge bolus of tests really um, came rolling into uh, into our core laboratory as each as different sites across the health system ran out of testing but they had us as a backup and so we're the backup, but what kept us from running out of tests is probably the question you're asking. And so how did we handle this, this type of testing volume? Well, really, we did this through a combination of our in-house flu AV RSV targeted respiratory panel and our multiplex respiratory panel. So for our targeted panel, we were using on the Luminex Aries assay, we were using the flu AV RSV, and on our multiplex panel, we had the Genmark ePlex. And fortunately, we went back to both vendors and uh, and asked them uh, if they could uh, and ask them as probably a little bit of a weak a weak way of saying it that <laughs> we uh, we we really um, pleaded with them to help us out as quick as they could and I have to say both of them helped us out and and they were able we were able to work with Luminex and get two additional units dropped in as an emergency measure and um, as far as for Genmark we had an an entire 24 bay instrument dropped in, into my laboratory uh, as a as a measure to, in order to get through this flu testing, giving me a total of 72 bays then on, on the three 24-plex areas, uh, um, uh, Genmark e-plexes that I had. And so working with both these vendors and, and having them work with me as a partnership really was, was uh, how we got through the flu season and redundancy. I think the important thing is that what Dr. Morgan said, the redundancy of making sure that you have enough capacity to actually handle the test. We also saw that uh, UTM was a was a major issue at one point, and we also indeed thought we were going to run out of UTM until we had an emergency measure and started working with a secondary vendor in order to get an emergency shipment, uh, a large shipment of UTM, which we distributed back to our various sites, and we also averted running out of UTM, but that was also a close call. So. Both, with that, both Dr. Morgan and I have been uh, talking about the various testing methodologies uh, that, that we've used to get through the flu season. And we've covered, uh, if, if not all of them, we've covered most of them. And so, which really begs the question, what are the benefits and drawbacks of each testing approach? And so with that, I'll hand it back over to Dr. Morgan to kick this segment off. 
Thank you, Dr. Barry. So I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of some of the different testing strategies. And I'm going to start with the pros and cons of the syndromic panels. So the cons, the test utilization issues. It is suggested, of course, that we only uh, order tests which are ordered by the clinician. So sometimes the syndromic panels have many more targets on their panel than what was actually ordered by a clinician. We're not able to conceal targets, so we must release all of them, even if the target was not ordered or if, if it's not even in season or would need to be tested. There's also optimal ordering and utilization. Need to carefully consider which patients will really benefit from such a very broad, expansive group of viral and bacterial targets. How to interpret the results if multiple targets are detected. Sometimes you could question the sensitivity of some of the targets on these very large syndromic panels. And cost to the laboratory. Cost has become a very important issue in my particular budget and hospital. I'm sure I share that with most of you. And it's particularly problematic if the cost data is siloed, such as we have at Cedars, where it's not the outcome data or other things that they look at. They actually look at how much we're actually spending in the laboratory. I also think at these times it's very important um, to look at the reimbursement issues. And I think we need to look at the cost to patients, particularly outpatients, uh, with decreasing reimbursement for these large panels. There's a lot of insurance policies out there now that have very high deductibles. We also have people in our ED that may not be insured or have um, what might be termed inadequate insurance policies. And so we, I think we really have to think of the side of how much do these type of panels actually cost to the patient? How are they billed to the patient? And um, we've even had discussions with our ED people saying that it should actually be presented to the patient prior to testing. You should never catch them off guard with the huge billing issues with some of these large syndromic panels. But there are pros to the syndromic panels, certainly. They have a very rapid turnaround time and you can test a lot of targets. They're capable of detecting a large number of pathogens, both viral and bacterial. It's certainly a good approach during non-influenza season or when you're heading into another season when no one virus may be dominant. And there's literature that said that you could actually lower the overall healthcare costs by rapidly detecting viral pathogens, thereby lowering the use of antibiotics. So it could help with your stewardship efforts. And Dr. Barry, I'll let you take it from there with the targeted panels. Thank you. Yeah, so when I talk about the targeted respiratory panels, I'm talking about uh, flu A, B, RSV. And just, just to clarify, this is, this is molecular testing for flu A, B, RSV, just in a smaller panel. And so I think the first pro is that these are more affordable than the larger panels, I mean, consider, which is really important when you're talking about the patient getting the bill, like many times is the case in the outpatient setting. Another point is that a pro is that they closely target seasonal uh, pathogens. So in flu season, flu or RSV is the most likely culprit, and so it's it's the uh, it's the most reasonable uh, targets. These are the most reasonable targets to test for during that time. Uh, another pro is that test interpretation is simpler. Fewer uh, there's fewer cases of multiple pathogens detected, and so the interpret overall interpretation of the test is easier. I think some of the cons, though, of, of a target respiratory panel are that uh, it does not detect other potential respiratory pathogens. And this really is important in critically ill patients and hospitalized patients where other respiratory pathogens may be suspected. And I think Dr. Morgan alluded to that when she talked about the pros of, of the larger panel. And I think along with this point of, uh, of detection, I think another con would be less targets means it's less useful for rule out or rule in, especially during the non-flu season. Uh, so if we don't get an answer during this during the non-flu season, it's really impossible to rule out rule in other respiratory pathogens, whether it be during non-flu season or whether it be in a critically ill patient population. And this is really uh, this is really where the larger panel would probably be more useful than the targeted panel. And so the next one I'll talk about, the next uh, testing methodology is flu testing at the point of care. And so uh, 
this is, this is another type of testing that can either be molecular testing or rapid antigen testing. So molecular testing is more the new kid on the block, so people aren't as familiar with it, but they are very familiar with the rapid antigen, uh, the, the lateral flow immunoassay flu test. And really the pro, just talking about the general pros of point of care testing, it has an extremely rapid turnaround time and you can get an answer in minutes. And this can facilitate therapeutic choices and, may, and therapeutic choices can actually be made in real time. So you can identify the treatment to administer and avoid unnecessary drugs and treatments based on knowing the pathogen. Really the cons of point of care testing, uh, specifically for rapid antigen tests, are that they're significantly less sensitive than lab testing. Uh, and I think Dr. Morgan talked about that 30 to 60% range, and that's, that's very much in keeping with, with what I've also seen in our health system when we look at the performance characteristics of rapid antigen tests. And many people aren't aware of the fact that they really are, uh, that they have such issues with sensitivity. Um, another con or that's a pro, there are pro, that's a pro that there's molecular options that, have, that actually, uh, get to the same sensitivity and specificity as lab tests, but they're very costly right now compared to uh, compared to rapid antigen tests, which is a con. And overall, in point of care, usually there's less oversight than laboratory testing because it's all different types of personnel doing the testing, where in the laboratory you're talking about trained medical technicians or medical technologists who are doing the testing. And so with that, I will hand it back over to Dr. Morgan to discuss a better way of, of uh, optimizing your testing. So if we put all of this together and everything that Dr. Barry and I said about the pros and cons of some of these tests, you know, maybe there's a, a better way that we can move forward taking all of this information into consideration. At least one can dream. So the way that I've kind of looked at it is that um, it, the better way might be to have a primary testing with a targeted seasonal panel in influenza season with appropriate reflex to an expanded panel, only if ordered by the MD. This approach is cost saving to the laboratory and places less cost burden on the patient, certainly if they're doing this sort of testing on outpatients for certain. We need to ask our stewardship committees or appropriate individuals, be it infection control or infectious disease, to assist us. I don't think we should be making all of these decisions alone, and I think that they can assist us with physician and nursing education, certainly concerning seasonal respiratory viral testing. Create computer job aids or prompts to assist MDs in ordering and understanding test orders and helps them to be more sufficient. And I'll be talking more about some of these issues when I move into how we're preparing for this year. I can tell you for sure, last year taught us a lot. Also, we need appropriate respiratory testing, certainly using sensitive molecular methods, because it should lead to the overall decreased prescribing of antibiotics. With that, um, I uh, pass this back on to uh, Dr. Barry to talk about another very, very critical point for flu testing. Oh, thanks so much, Dr. Morgan. Yeah, and I think we've been talking a lot, both of us, about which test is optimal. But there's really another critically important step in, in testing, in respiratory testing, to consider when we're discussing how a flu test performs, and that would be uh, proper specimen collection. So, you know, which would go, of course, into the pre-analytical phase of, of testing. And really, this, this is critical. So that's the, spe you know, talking about specimen collection, here we have, we have Two different options, right? Well, I think that everybody knows that for flu, nobody's going to do a throat swab. But the question I ask the audience is, you know that, I know that, but does everybody who collects these tests, is everybody aware of why that's, why that's the case? Is everybody aware of the fact that a nasal swab or nasal pharyngeal swab would be the correct test for flu? Whereas if you were talking about strep, of course, it would be a throat swab and why that's the case. And I think it all goes back to education. And so when we talk for the flu, about the flu, you're thinking about a nasal or a nasal pharyngeal swab. Ideally, you're thinking a nasal pharyngeal swab collected within three days of symptom onset. And so the reason for this is, of course, that's when, uh, that's when the patient's most infectious. That's when the viral burden is the highest. And that's also when, uh, when drug choices like Tamiflu would actually be the most effective. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, the, um, the usefulness of the test result really declines over time, even if it is positive. Um, in this case, you would use a sterile Dacron or nylon swab. 
you would insert it into the posterior pharynx and tonsillar areas, remove the swab, and then place in a UTM uh, or universal transport medium or viral transport medium. And you would test this if it was at point of care ASAP or if the lab is right nearby ASAP, or you would keep the specimen at four degrees C until it could be until it could be tested. And here you can see uh, this is supposed to be a picture of, of how to do the perfect nasopharyngeal swab, and you can see that this, this patient is absolutely calm. Uh, I'm sure that this is the case. Uh, this is always the case, I'm sure. <laughs> so now with this, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Morgan, who's going to discuss preparations for the upcoming flu season. So um, after last year, I think we learned a lot, perhaps through um, – um, some painful situations, but we certainly did gather a lot of information and think a lot about how we could do it better this coming season. So how are we preparing or at least attempting to prepare for the upcoming influenza season? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to follow very closely uh, the World Health Organization or Australia's Flu Surveillance Network and see when the influenza season is taking off in those countries and quietly um, prepare and, and revisit their website starting right now even and going into early September to see what is out there. Believe it or not, I think just to, for this um, webinar, we had our first case of influenza at Cedars this morning. Uh, we detected it on one of our panels, a, a molecular panel, and the individual had been to the Philippines and just returned from the Philippines and has influenza AH3. So I think it's beginning, and so we can start looking at these uh, networks and see if we can gain some information about which virus is out there and if it's going to be a gangbuster season like last year or maybe perhaps a quieter season. So follow some of these networks to get an idea of what is coming our way. What can we do in our own community? Well, of course, we need to encourage flu vaccination for children as well as for adults, of course, and particularly the elderly that tend to fall victim very much so to H3. We also need to encourage streptococcus pneumonia vaccination. We had many elderly last year fall victim to influenza and then have streptococcus pneumonia as a secondary bacterial infection, and we had some deaths associated with this, and they had not been vaccinated to strep pneumo. Of course, the efficacy of the vaccine last year was not stellar. They put it around 30%. And it was somewhat due to the manufacturing of the vaccine with the H3 component. But we noticed at Cedars, and I'm sure everyone saw the same thing, that those vaccinated did experience less serious disease than those that had not been vaccinated at all. We should, of course, encourage hand washing in everyone out in the community and, of course, in the hospital. And hospital-wide, we need to keep close eye to our ED, monitor the activity, see if anything is starting to happen yet? Are we there yet? And network with our infection control people that always network well with CDC and other surveillance networks to just know if we're nearing the season. We just met yesterday, in fact, with our emergency department, um, our infection control, in, and our in, uh, infectious disease representatives. And we had a committee meeting and talked, and it was a, a great time just talking about last year and how we can make it better this year. And I really encourage everyone to do this. It was so helpful. It was educational for everyone to exchange ideas, talk about what went wrong last year, what went right, and try to move forward. What did we come up with? Well, let's start over on the left-hand side. The laboratory test volume, the ED knew we were overwhelmed last year, and they're actually going to develop a document uh, that perhaps can help us uh, better them better select the patients that they believe need to have point-of-care testing. They're going to develop a guideline document and keep it posted readily available for the physician. Specimen collection. We know that that was a big problem at Cedars and most of our specimens are being collected in the ED. We're going to have ongoing specimen collection education, but the other thing that the ED thinks could be very useful is monitor the individual nursing doing the collection and feed them back their data as a means of education. Let them know if they're not perhaps 
doing as well as others in the specimen collection. So maybe that education will be more meaningful, because I think we all know that our education just seems to fall flat a lot of the times. They need to continue to assess the patient population. RED has a lot of poorly insured or uninsured adults and children. So as you can see in the center column, we're going to try to limit unnecessary testing by following those guidelines, perform targeted RS flu and RSV testing only on the seriously ill, and we will do it by point of care antigen testing so there is not a huge financial burden on the patient. Um, also, if they know the patient is going to be admitted, then they could go ahead and order molecular panel testing as the patient is being admitted. But if the patient is truly an outpatient and headed home, we're staying with the point of care antigen testing because of the billing to the patient and the um, and issues that we might create if by ordering more expensive molecular testing. Should we perform a test of value? On the right-hand side of this chart, we discussed this. And what we came up with was some pros and cons um, to offering molecular point-of-care testing in the emergency department. There are pros. Of course, it's rapid. It's more sensitive than our flu, A, B, RSV antigen-type testing. And it could help assist with guiding therapy decisions. But the cons, low throughput, the number of instruments that might be required, the cost. It is far more expensive compared to the antigen test. And these are outpatients that we're dealing with, so it would be a more expensive cost to the patient. And they're really questioning, would it really change their management of the outpatient? They're not quite sure that it would, and there's going to be much cutting back of actually even using the antigen testing on some of our outpatients. They were saying one of the primary ways that they're using antigen testing in our ED is to determine if a patient maybe needs to be admitted or if other types of tests such as blood cultures and other things need to be ordered. I think the one thing that I picked up from talking to all these folks yesterday was ED thinks differently than the microbiology laboratory does, and it's really interesting to hear what they have to say and what's important to them and what's not, and they can really um, provide you some some very interesting insight. One of the things I think was most interesting was they were talking about the use of cantaloupes uh, for training for the collection. Like Dr. Barry saying, collection is so important. And they talked about how they can use a cantaloupe uh, to teach the nursing personnel better how to insert a nasal swab and how it feels and how better it works. So, I mean, who would have thought of that? I mean, they just have um, really great thoughts, and I really, really value meeting with these individuals. For our hospital inpatient testing, well, I have my picture of my resident over there on the right-hand side, and that's about how effective my teaching has been over the years. They're just so overwhelmed with what they need to learn. They just don't really can absorb everything that we're trying to say to them. But they do need to know. So how can we make it more impactful? Well, we think that if we have immediate alerts on the computer, immediately access to education at the time of ordering, that could maybe be more helpful than if we do educational seminars prior to the, ed uh, to the influenza season. The other thing, we need to order our supplies early, and we need to check all places, such as our su uh, central supply, to make sure they have universal transport medium. We forgot about them last year. We need to check on everything and really have a thorough search. Are we ready to go? And we think we need to look at our own personnel in the laboratory. Should we train more CLS? Oh, my goodness, all the training and competency that's involved. So is that a, a solution or not? Should we extend our hours of testing? Is that a good solution, just throwing people at this problem? We should cross-train more individuals, such as our MLAs, to help our CLSs in some of the screening of specimens and freezing and such. Better use, make them more productive, make the workflow better. And we need to strictly enforce that ill laboratorians need to stay home. We really appreciated them coming in trying to help, but we had times where half our staff almost was ill with symptoms. And then I will um, take this and give the floor over to, um, well, first I'll talk about ruling out influenza A and B and RSV and the inpatient testing plans. So I talked about what we're going to do in the ED, but this is what we're thinking about inside the hospital. 
we're going to use target RP flex flu A and B and RSV as our primary panel in influenza season, as we did last year. That worked very well. We're going to use our syndromic panel um, only if the test volume exceeds the ability of the RP flex panel to be performed in a reasonable time, and we will have it available for redundancy. But we're hoping that we order correctly and get things in gear better this year, so maybe we do not have to fall back on that so much. If additional viral pathogens are desired, however, we can open up our RP flex panel. We can have it available throughout the year for testing viral pathogens uh, in non-influenza. And we're going to try to save our syndromic panel and use it where we think it is the greatest test of value and provides the most benefit. We have our bronchial alveolar lavages um, validated on the syndromic panel, and we can also use it throughout the year for our immune suppressed population and the pediatrics possibly if they want this expansive viral and bacterial pathogen detection but we're going to try to stay as focused on the RP flex as much as possible. Dr. Barry, I will now hand it back over to you to discuss how you're going to approach this flu season. Well, you know, thank you uh, for, for giving a great overview of the ED and inpatient testing and, and also for reminding me that I have to pick up some cantaloupe after work. Uh, <laughs> so let me now, now let me briefly discuss the differences between inpatient and outpatient testing and really the needs for each type of testing. And so when we talk about the nuances between these two and we talk about inpatients, we're really talking about uh, a population that includes critically old patients, immunosuppressed patients, elderly, pediatric, as well as others. And really in this case, limited respiratory testing alone uh, is not adequate. And so during the flu season, in this patient population, you'd really want to consider uh, offering both the targeted and syndromic panel option, and potentially with that reflex algorithm, which I think uh, was, was covered uh, extensively. And now when we talk about outpatients, uh, we're thinking about the majority of the patients really only needing flu and RSV testing during the respiratory season. And in this case, a syndromic panel is, is not necessary in many cases because a lot of these are self-limiting infections and in the outpatient setting. And in this case, you'd want to consider uh, targeted panels or a molecular point of care test as a particular option. And really, what, but what I would not recommend is using only rapid antigen testing alone due to the poor sensitivity. Uh, maybe as part of a reflex algorithm, this would be useful. And so... Just to summarize what both Dr. Morgan and I talked about, uh, some of the some of the things that I that I hope that uh, that we both hope that you got from the lecture are that uh, uh, the 2017-2018 flu season was really a year to remember, but it was also a year that taught us a lot of valuable lessons. And while institutions uh, may differ in a lot of different ways. Uh, many of the same factors must be considered no, no matter where you're at, whether you're in a, a standalone hospital, a health system. Uh, across the board, there are many things that need to be considered. And I think some of, the, some of the commonalities are you need to look at the test algorithm and pick an algorithm with a high sensitivity and specificity. So only having a rapid antigen only available for your system is, is probably not the best choice. Uh, education on test, test ordering and also specimen collection, which we both talked about uh, quite a bit because it's such an important part of, uh, of flu testing and respiratory testing in general. I think the proper triaging of testing. So when, when, uh, when things are happening in the flu season is, is, in its, uh, is in its full swing, who needs to be tested, who doesn't need to be tested, and what's the consensus in your health system? And having that conversation early, like Dr. Morgan has already done. Uh, redundancy of flu testing platforms. I think that both of us discussed uh, how critical redundancy was in, in flu testing and having um, Having more than one option is always a very good thing. And testing value. So what, what type of testing is needed for, for your particular situation? Uh, a, full, a, a full panel, a limited panel, et cetera. And so, and I think importantly, different patient populations have very different testing needs. So uh, the, these are all important factors to consider. And so when you look and you make your decision, just consider all these factors as you make your decisions for next year. And so thank, thank you everybody for, uh, for your attention, and I'll hand it back over to Bob. Dr. Barry, thank you very much, and thank you, Dr. Morgan, uh, for a wonderful presentation. 
we do have some time remaining for questions and comments. We've gotten some, but let me remind you, if you'd like to type in a question or comment in the box below the slide, uh, do please feel free to do so, and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. In addition to that, you should know that all the questions will be supplied, and our sponsor and friends at Luminex uh, will uh, help us deal with these so that everyone finally gets an answer. And with that, let me go ahead and plunge right into some questions. We have extremely good ones here. We have one very good question that I know will be on the minds of many. Uh, and I will ask you to start uh, the answer here, Dr. Morgan, and then we'll hear from Dr. Berry. Do the various insurance companies that you deal with pay for the multiplex molecular panel, like the RP on the biofire? Um, this is, um, I, I will start with an answer, and I'm sure Dr. Berry can add to it. I am by no means uh, an insurance expert. However, I do uh, end up hearing a lot about this because it is certainly a topic for discussion within my own institution. Um, there's ongoing um, issues with, uh, in our institution and others with uh, full reimbursement of the syndromic respiratory panels. Um, and um, we are um, concerned uh, in which way this is headed, and we feel that we get a more accurate um, or more reliable reimbursement using a limited multiplex with, say, four to five targets, and that um, over time, um, with the changing reimbursement as we hear it coming down the pike, that will be a more reliable test to be reimbursed. Dr. Berry, why don't you add to that? You might be more of a reins an insurance expert than I am. Oh, I'm surely not more of an insurance expert than you are, but I think that there's always a question about the larger panels and the reimbursement issues. I can't say that, that we've gotten a tremendous amount of pushback with the coverage, but I know it's always a conversation and it's always a hot topic about where that field is going and, and what the coverage is going to be. So, uh, so, I know that many of the insurance companies do cover it, but uh, I'm I'm not sure as far as uh, which companies would and wouldn't cover it or, or how that works. I know that there many of the companies are covering it, but there are also questions about the clinical utility of the larger panels in certain patient populations. Thank you. And now uh, we've heard from an old friend. Who I hope you won't mind if I mention your name. Dr. Cynthia Bowman has joined us in the audience today and asked a wonderfully good question. And Dr. Barry, I'm going to ask you to answer this uh, first. Is there evidence about the significance of co-infection or multiple positive re results from the viral panel results? Can you comment about cohorting patients based on panel results? So, you know, during the flu season, uh, we we commonly get co-infections two and three positives at a time on on. Uh, I'm not an insignificant number of our panels. And as far as the significance, so usually I, I think it just shows that there's co-infections uh, at the same time as flu, but I, I'm not really aware of evidence of the significance of those multiple positive targets as far as being addressed in, in, in the clinical literature. Uh, and unfortunately, I know of, I know of the, the situation, but as far as the clinical utility of it, it it's kind of a, I'm, I'm hanging up on that part of the question, but, uh, about the cohorting of patients based on panel results, I know that the, the many institutions do use the results for cohorting. I know that uh, even we, as far as our res full respiratory panel, that cohorting does occur based on the results and knowing the pathogens and knowing common pathogens uh, is definitely a way that infection control can work on cohorting of patients. Thank you. And let me skip ahead because we have so many questions. I would like to get most of those in if I may. Uh, let, you, let me also tell you that uh, uh, cantaloupes are much on everyone's minds now. It's sort of like <laughs> saying rhinoceros will never stop thinking about it for yeah, the rest never, of the day. You'll never eat a cantaloupe in the same way, will you? <laughs> we you'll probably never will. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> let me, uh, let me uh, make sure I get this one question in because I'm sure it's the one that weighs mostly on the minds of most of our attendees today. Uh, we have spoken, of course, with a lot of advice about the upcoming season. 
But to, in, as part of our retrospective of last season, could you both uh, remark, and I'll ask uh, Dr. Morgan to begin, uh, what prior information was available to you as to the seriousness of the season last year? And was that prior information sufficient? Then, of course, if the questioner's wondering how, what kind of a season you're anticipating and uh, any references to help give an idea of what to expect from this upcoming season. Um, Dr. Morgan. That's a, a very interesting question. Um, uh, last year, um, my infection control practitioner, who is um, um, a very avid reader and a very well-networked and, 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 and visits the surveillance networks a good deal of time, um, did warn us to the activity that was going on in Australia, which has a very, very good surveillance network, somewhat similar to ours in the way that they produce information. And he warned us that there was an unusual amount of influenza H3 activity uh, in um, Australia and that there was some talk about the vaccine not being very effective. So we were alerted that it was going to be, uh, possibly going to be a very, very busy year. But as I said in my talk, what's busy versus what happened. And we were prepared for what we thought was a busy year, but had no idea how busy it was going to be. Maybe I didn't listen closely enough to my infection control person or read enough on the Australian website, but we underestimated it. Um, as, um, as available information, um, there's a lot of, um, as I said, you can go to the World Health Organization and their website and look for influenza information. Australia has a, um, a public health department, has a very nice website. You can go and see that they're starting to report uh, small amounts of H3 right now, a uh, little bit of H1, but things are not brewing very much right now. It's really been um, rather quiet. I was just talking to someone that works in my laboratory that had just uh, returned from the Philippines. And as I said in my talk, we have our first positive today, and he had just returned from the Philippines. He has H3, influenza A. And she was saying that while she was in the Philippines that, that there was a lot of people coming down with what they thought was influenza. So I think that we might be seeing it starting just now, um, which is the normal time. Usually the end of August is when it does start in Southeast Asia. And so I think now is the time to start every uh, few days looking at the website and maybe we can better tell what might be heading our way. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Barry. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think I can add much to that, but just to, to add to, I think that I'm paying a lot more attention to what's going on in Australia this year than maybe what I did last year. I remember reading the news last year and then you, you kind of said, well, I wonder if it is going to trend this way. We'll, we'll see uh, how much of a, uh, of a harpinger this is what's going on in australia and in fact last year it was it was quite spot on so i i guess um i'm paying a lot more attention this year and with it being a mild season i'm wondering now what we're going to end up seeing and, and we'll see now if it if it indeed is it does trend that direction but that that's really all of that that i can that i can add to that thank you we have another a very interesting question at least i find it quite interesting i'm sure you will as well and this is uh, stated as follows. As a laboratory, do we have a responsibility to ensure we are reporting the most highly accurate results available and leave the decision to order or not to order following CDC guidelines to the providers? I think that's very clear, but it's also a very sharp and pointed question. Uh, Dr. Barry, uh, could you briefly comment on that? I would think that as you know, as a lab, I think we do have that responsibility to make sure that we that we are providing the test that is going to be the test that's most diagnostically useful in the situation. So for us as a lab, it's the highest sensitivity, the highest specificity, and if which we do obviously have for respiratory testing. And I think though, if if we do have a test that we're running. Like, for example, if we were using a rapid antigen test because it's what we're able to provide, that just that we express the caveats of that type of testing and that we explain the limitations very clearly to the providers. And I think as long as we do that, I think that we're good. But I think we do have a responsibility to provide uh, the most highly accurate results, of course. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Barry, that brings up a very interesting point. And then in our meeting yesterday um, with the uh, ED group, 
um, they wanted us to prepare in those guidelines that I was talking about. And in that, they wanted us to put testing information about each of the tests that are available so that the clinicians would be able to see um, the sensitivity and such of what they are ordering so they can have, as you say, uh, doing diagnostically useful testing but understanding some of the pros and cons of each of the tests. So I think physicians yeah, I are aware of that. It's just we have to help them be aware of it. Go ahead, Dr. Berry. Oh, no, I, I really, you know, I really think that's an excellent point. And, you know, and the other thing is if you're talking about patients walking to the – swamping the ED because of, because they need simple flu testing, you're talking about patients in an outpatient clinic, a rapid antigen test may be very useful for the positive result, right? But you would never want to use that test on, for example, an immunosuppressed patient who, who is in the ICU, you know? I mean, so it's, it's – uh, it's interesting. Every every test has its usefulness. That's for sure. And I think as long as as long as they understand that the test they're ordering is being used in the proper fashion, then I think I think we're good. And I think I think Dr. Morgan, I think you you're setting up an algorithm that that really makes sense considering the the way you're you're trying to design it. Well, let's hope. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you a question that almost always pops up in this context. Uh, we currently offer molecular tests for flu and flu slash uh, RSV that can be ordered separately. Do you think that RSV should be tested for in all patient populations? Margie, I'll let you do answer that first. Well, um, I do have perhaps a unique population uh, that I'm testing in my hospital. I have a lot of very elderly patients um, and very few children. And so one would say, well, perhaps we don't need the RSV because historically we've always thought of um, RSV as being a primary um, pediatric um, pathogen. But as my uh, in my talk, I said that uh, during the height of influenza season, 20% of our viral pathogen burden was RSV in our elderly patients. Um, so. Um, I would say it should be included in the primary testing in my particular patient situation, but you may have seen different data and have uh, different thoughts on that, and perhaps that is um, somewhat uh, something that every hospital and laboratory needs to take a look at. But in our medical center, we think inclusion of RSV is quite important. What do you think, Dr. Berry? Well, you know, it's funny. We actually, and I don't know if it's because it's the pediatric patients in the outpatient clinics, uh, because I, I, I should do a deeper dive into that data, but we also saw a very high rate of RSV. And so, I mean, it, you know, you think of, right, the young, you think of it as, as a pediatric disease, and then in the elderly population, I mean, RSV can be an issue. But I would say with, with the high burden of RSV infection, it actually, it's been very useful to have it on the limited panel. Very good. And now a, another a question almost always predictable in a discussion like this, and I'm going to ask you, Dr. Berry, to lead this uh, answering session. How do you get buy-in from physicians, especially from the emergency department, that the algorithms that you're proposing are appropriate to care? Are there automatic algorithms that might be triggered in, triggered in the medical record? And if so, are they laboratory driven or are they more coming and driven from the diagnostic stewardship and infection prevention folks? Uh, not to mention, I think by diagnostic stewardship, we also mean antibiotic stewardship. So it, it, I guess it's kind of unfair for me uh, to, to answer this question because I've not driven, <laughs> I've not had to drive the algorithm like Dr. Morgan has. We've actually allow them to order which tests they want to order. And as far as limiting testing, for example, we're getting rid of rapid antigen flu tests for all of our hospitals. That's kind of how we drive testing uh, testing uh, usage by basically we put a we put a, a flu A, B, R, S, V molecular option and then a full panel orderable, but got rid of the rapid antigen testing for them. So I, I haven't really had to get a tremendous amount of buy-in for any kind of algorithm like Dr. Morgan has. <laughs> Yeah, I would. Okay, um, so Dr. Morgan, that tees you <laughs> up to tell us how you did it. Well, I'm, I'm not saying that we're always successful, but as I said in my um, general introduction of my um, institution, uh, we have um, mostly private practice physicians, 
and um, they um, have opinions and um, they um, need reasons and they want to make sure that um, they're part of the algorithm preparation and such. So we, as I said, microbiology alone, we do not make these algorithms and make these decisions on our own. Um, I might not survive a flu season if I were to do so. Um, we need to meet with our stewardship people, our infectious infectious disease, infection control, and we included ED yesterday as well in our group. We will have uh, similar discussions with our stewardship pharmacists as time moves on. And we develop group algorithms that all different divisions within the hospital support. So I have support in what the laboratory is offering and what we are doing. It would be a very difficult situation for us to stand alone without having support from all of these other people in the preparation of these algorithms. And if we do prepare one with all of these people, usually there's enough discussion and enough um, uh, um, information that everyone feels comfortable moving forward with them. And so when the algorithm starts, we don't get a lot of complaints. And so that's the way we've approached it over the last two or three years, and it seems to have worked fairly well. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to ask one final question now. We've heard about the new policy at Northwell regarding rapid antigen testing in the hospital. Uh, yeah. Dr. Berry, could you talk about rapid antigen testing in the outpatient setting? Uh, obviously, this has been a huge debate now that spans several years and seems to yeah. have cropped up yeah. uh, many years ago particularly, but is still alive and well. So talk about yeah. rapid antigen yeah. testing in the outpatient setting within Northwell, and then I'll ask Dr. Morgan to comment in her experience in the Cedar sinai Network. You know, I saw I saw Dr. Frances Valencia's question. She's a friend of mine, so she wants to know if uh, if Dr. Morgan and I are going to write a uh, a paper about the pros and cons. That's, that's probably a good idea, don't you? Don't you think? <laughs> Maybe, thank you. Perhaps we should. Uh, thank you, Frances. Thank uh, so, you for thinking yeah. it's worthy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so let me talk about rapid antigen in the outpatient setting. So yeah, I think in the outpatient setting. So for example, we have over 250 outpatient clinics that we either that we that we are affiliated with or that we serve as far as testing goes. And in those outpatient clinics, I I do see a place for rapid antigen, especially for the for the near future and maybe for the for the foreseeable short term future. That rapid antigen testing, if you're talking about patients that are coming in and they need the quick yes answer for flu, I, I do see the usefulness of the test in that capacity. I think though as I think if, if somebody wanted a more sensitive test and you and you said all things being equal, would you like the more sensitive test in ten minutes or would you like the less sensitive test in ten minutes? I think obviously everybody's going to want the more sensitive and the more specific test. But I think if you bring the cost factors and the reimbursement factors in, I think that that brings the rapid antigen test back into the back into the mix. Is that fair? Yes, Dr. Dr. Morgan. Barry, I, yeah, I think Dr. Barry presented this um, very nicely. Um, as I said in um, my discussion that uh, with the ED people that the cost consideration was very important. But if we could offer a rapid molecular test with greater sensitivity for the same cost uh, to us and the same cost to the patient, they would be very much in favor of that as well. And so I think, as Dr. Berry says, it's a matter of time before possibly these two things merge and that we can move forward with maybe more sensitive testing for the outpatient setting. But for right now, I think we're fairly entrenched with the rapid antigen uh, because of all of those things that I talked about in my discussion. Thank you very much. And Dr. Morgan, with that, I'll give you the last word. And now as we uh, wrap up, I do want to thank our two speakers who've just done a marvelous job today. I'm sure you'll want to go to captodayonline.com. You'll have a chance to review all the slides and all the audio. Uh, all the questions uh, were wonderful, and I thank you for those. So once again, let me thank Dr. Margie Morgan of Cedar sinai Dr. Gregory Berry of Northwell, and I want to thank in particular our sponsor for today, Luminex, who've made this possible, and I salute them for uh, helping select this topic and organizing such a stimulating and useful program, particularly as we stare into the future 
and the new flu season that's just around the corner. And finally, I want to thank all of you who've taken time out of a very busy laboratory day to join us here at this CAP Today webinar. We're very grateful for your participation. We look forward to your feedback and your views about this. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, with that, once again, thanks to all. And with that, I'll close the webinar and wish all of you a very good day. Thank you so much.